Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to God's house this morning. Wow, can't believe we're in December already. I don't know about you, but I enjoy having some Christmas music and the gift giving and not to mention the shopping, although these days it seems to be a lot more online, which is kind of sad. But uh, it seems that uh, Christmas is a little different. How are you doing this Christmas? I think for many of us, it's a hard time. For some, it's harder when we can't get together with family. Maybe it's a lonely time for you, but it can be a really good time as well. But I think for most of us in this Christmas time, we're kind of scrambling to figure out Christmas traditions because it's just not the same. And so I hope that in this Christmas time, you're finding your way. But when you do feel a little bit lost and in the dark, the good news is that Jesus came down to this earth to bring us light in our darkness. Amen? John, speaking of this light, says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, nor will it. See, when you're confused and lost in the dark, when you turn to Jesus, you can find light. You can find the way. And boy, I tell you, when you find light in a dark place, it gives you a lot of joy, doesn't it? And confidence, and it renews our hearts. So this morning, we want to come to Jesus and sing as Vic and a lot of our guests <laughs> come and uh, lead us in singing. Why don't we stand together as we sing? seated. Just a few announcements. Um, for those of you who knew them, uh, Gladie Liss just passed away last night. So I'll be praying for Ross. And also about a week ago, um, Marjorie Stoffer also passed away. So please be praying for their families. Um, on a positive uh, note, I think Tuesday is the Gonzalez's 30th wedding anniversary um, over there. So make sure you say congratulations to them, to you guys. And uh, also, you may have noticed there's a bunch of people from the Roberts family here this morning. And uh, they're celebrating their family reunion with us. So thank you for joining us this morning. Just a few other announcements following the service we have a brief discussion time to uh, discuss a proposal we're thinking about um, for those that are part of our church. And uh, we don't have a separate 
a live stream link for you, but if you just stay with us and give us a few minutes after the service, uh, you can just stay with us for that to join in. And then next week we will be having our annual meeting together as a church after the service. Um, thank you to everybody who helped with the uh, Christmas decorations. Uh, Via Church helped last week. Shirley Ann and some of her friends helped this week. So thank you for that. It looks really nice in here. And if you're at home and you're missing some of those Christmas decorations, come on down. We got them here. And for those of you who are visiting or um, have not kept up, we are supporting refugee family, uh, Afghani family that's stuck in Tajikistan. Um, we've had some significant donations and uh, we have the last kind of piece of the puzzle is we have a, uh, a donor who's giving us a matching grant up to $5,000 which should help us finish it off if we can get 10000 and uh, that's open till Christmas and uh, you just have to designate in your online giving at finance at nbcchurch.ca and just write in there refugees and it will go to that family. And we only have, I think, about $1,300 left to make our goal. So thank you for everybody who has been giving, and I encourage you to make one last effort. And of course, please don't forget our regular uh, tithes and offerings. We desperately need that to help us with the programs we do, to help uh, Canadian Baptist Ministries, our denomination, and our church reach out. Without that, we can't carry on. So thank you for those of you who are giving. Um, although the shoebox thing is done, you can still bring them and uh, we can get them to Samaritan's Purse. I was just up there on uh, last week with Aziz and to see a warehouse far larger than our building full of people sorting shoeboxes and getting them ready was pretty Need to see. And if you've never been up to the Samaritan's Purse headquarters for Western Canada, up um, by Barlow and McKnight, it's a quite a, a interesting thing, especially this time of year, to see what they're doing. And Aziz and I were talking to them about how we can support the Afghanis that are coming here. The government hopes to bring in about 5,000 at least to Calgary. And so we have lots of work to do and exciting possibilities. So keep praying along with us. Let's just pray as we begin our service. Uh, and before I pray, for those of you that have kids, there is Sunday school downstairs, and you can go right now if you would like to join in the Sunday school. Sure, Leanna is waiting for you at the back. So, yes, parent needs to go down with them and sign them in and pick them up. So, thank you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for each person here. For those that are listening online, just bless them, watch over them. And I just pray that you would put courage and joy in our hearts at a time where there are so many things that distract us and rattle us and probably pull us in the wrong direction. God, we need your strength today. We need your mercy. We need your peace. We need your joy. God, give us the strength. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to worship you in a free country. God, give us the courage to make bold use of our freedom, to share Jesus with many people this Christmas. God, there is so much good news about Christmas that people need to hear. Lord, I just pray for the Liss family, and the Stauffer family, that you would watch over them and comfort them in their losses. God, these are tough times for people. Lord, I just pray for those here that knew them, that you would comfort us in our loss. We grieve them as they're part of our family. Lord, I just thank you too for the way you continue to draw people to yourself. And I thank you for those among us that you have drawn here. God, as we continue to worship you this morning, I pray that you would bring us joy that you would make us very much aware of your presence. And Lord, so we look forward to good things from your hand as we sing and as we worship and as we learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team's gonna be leading us. Why don't we stand together?
be seated. Good morning. Today, we relight the candle of hope. Now we light the candle for the second Sunday in Advent. This is a candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace from the prophet Isaiah. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. From the Gospel of John, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. John 14, 27. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and in our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and in the countries of our world. Help us to see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you only are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. As the group come up, I'd like to introduce them. There's Brian Kaiser and Ruth Kaiser, Dale Harbage and Susan Harbage. They're uh, a couple of them are relatives. <laughs> They're both families. <laughs> Thank you for singing with us. 
Well, I want to talk about being lost today. Anybody ever had an experience of being lost? <laughs> I seem to have had quite a few of them, but I remember a number of years ago, I was in India, probably about 1984, and I was in New Delhi, and I was trying to find an address. And I knew the number and the name of the street, but I, had, I and remember, this is before GPS, no cell phone, okay? And so I'm trying to find this place, and the maps aren't terribly accurate. I don't think I even had a map. So I started asking the locals, can you tell me where this street is? No problem, go right over there. So I slowly made my way, found the street, great. Started walking along the street, and discovered after a while that I seemed to be going the wrong direction and the numbers were changing, not the way I wanted them to go. And so I'm going around, I feel like I'm going around in circles. And eventually I stop again and asked a couple different people. One person pointed this way, the other person pointed that way. I thought, uh oh, I'm in trouble. But anyways, long story short, I kept asking, kept looking, kept going along the street and eventually I found the place. What I found out later is this street is actually in the shape of a spiral, which really threw me off. So no wonder I got lost. But boy, I tell you, when you're in a strange city and you feel helpless because you just don't have any of the usual boundaries and, and landmarks, you can feel pretty helpless, especially when you're, you know, Hindi isn't that great. Another story. This time I was on a summer mission in Erie and Jaya, which is the west half of New Guinea, very rugged mountainous terrain. And I was going from one town in the central highlands to another town, about 26 miles, about a marathon, except I had all day to do it. And I was going to be walking with this other missionary kid who lived in that next village. He'd been back and forth many times, he said, no problem. And I was young, so it should be no problem to do 26 miles in a whole day. I'm not going to run it, but we'll get there. So we began going up and down these mountains. What I realized very quickly is that uh, even though I was young and I was in decent shape, I wasn't used to the mountain air. We were about 6,000 feet up. And so I was getting tired a lot quicker than usual. And he was all raring to go. He was used to this. Well, long story short, we got about 20 miles in. At six miles left, it's starting to get dark. He realizes I'm not going to make it. So he says, you know what? I'm going to run, run ahead. I'll go grab my motorbike from home, come back and get you. Great. Well, here's the problem. He's leaving me alone in a place I've never been before, it's getting dark. I have no landmarks, there's no street lights, it is pitch black in a place that I don't know anything. And you can imagine how the darkness closes in pretty quickly and your imagination starts to go wild. I'm in a tropical country, you're wondering what kind of creepy crawly things are out there, right? And it does not feel safe. And I feel completely on my own and lost. The good news is, after a few sweaty hours, he did come back and get me and everything was fine. But it's amazing at how lostness can close in on you. One final story. As some of you know, we have six kids. And so when they were growing up, we would always, I don't know how many thousands of times I counted to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. good, they're all here. One, two, yep, they're all here whether in the mall or the fairgrounds or wherever we were in a crowd especially, you're always checking to make sure they're all there, right? Well, this one particular year we were on holidays, I think it was Rocky Mountain House, we were in a campground, and again, we start counting, and one, two, three, four, five. Wait, wait a second, where's number six? And so we started looking, and we're starting to panic because we can't see Jenna anywhere. And so after looking frantically, we couldn't find her. We talked to the staff at the campground and said, look, we can't find our daughter. She's vulnerable. So they did the smart thing. They closed off the exit to the campground in case somebody was trying to abduct her or whatever. Long story short, after looking all over the place, eventually we found her in a tent behind somebody's trailer, having a great time playing with her friend. 
She didn't understand what the big deal was. She was having fun. She didn't feel lost. And see, here's the thing. A lot of times you can be lost and not even know it. And there are a lot of people today that are lost without even knowing it. Some are desperately lost and want to be found. But there are many that are lost. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to be born into a world as a savior to a world that largely didn't even realize how lost they were. I don't think when the shepherds were running off to Bethlehem that they were running to Bethlehem primarily because they felt lost. They knew their way around. They didn't feel lost. Or how about the wise men a little while later when they were making their way to Bethlehem? I don't think they went there because they felt lost. In fact, obviously they were pretty good at finding directions, but they were lost. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, as people were wondering why in the world Jesus would ever go to see Zacchaeus, this terrible tax collector, Jesus said, I have come for this very reason, to seek and to save those who are lost. See, in Jesus' mind, Zacchaeus was tragically lost, while everybody else around it didn't think so or didn't know. As we move into this Advent season, I want to, for those of you who have been with us, we've been looking at a series called Fake News, The Lies We Tell Ourselves. And this morning I want to talk about the lie that says, you know, people without Jesus are not really lost. They're fine. I mean, if people have never heard of Jesus, I mean, if they're good people, surely a loving God is not going to send them away forever, is he? And this hits particularly close to home when you are around people who may not know Jesus, or maybe your own kids or grandkids are not making good choices in terms of God. And we wonder, and we think, well, you know what, they're pretty good people. God probably has something good for them. Now, before we will ever be passionate about sharing Jesus to those people, we need to understand what lostness really is. What is it really like to be without Jesus? And are people really lost? Well, there are several scriptures that talk about what lostness is. First, in Romans, we find that we all fall short of God's glory. Romans 3.23 says, We have all sinned, all of us, and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, even when we see good people, even when we see the perfect human being, they still fall short of God's glory. In other words, if you're an Olympic swimmer and you're trying to get from Vancouver to Hawaii, you're not going to make it. Even if you're a perfect swimmer, we just can't do it. And that's what it is like for human beings trying to reach a perfect God. It can't be done. Which means if God wants heaven to remain this perfect place, he can't let us in unless something is done. And I think it's important for all of us as people who follow Jesus to be careful that we are living that truth. Not that we are flaunting our sinful nature, but we are open with people that we sin. Our kids need to know that we're sinners. As pastor, I am a sinner. I mess up all the time. Just ask Mabel, our secretary. We're not perfect people. We need to recognize that we need the grace of God or we would never make it. And we need to live a life built around the grace of Jesus. And our families need to be mercy-based families where we are sharing God's grace because we mess up not rule-based, deed-based families. Secondly, sin is, sin is preferring creation over the creator. So in Romans 1.22, it says that 
While we claimed to be wise, we actually became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So you're offered the glory of God through Jesus for your soul's satisfaction, but instead we say, you know what? I don't really want just that. I would rather trade that in for a car, a TV, a screen, food, job, a spouse, anything. And we exchange the glory of God for some different treasure, and that becomes our treasure. That's what sin is. When we're preferring the glory of God, preferring other glory over the glory of God. Thirdly, sin is spiritual deadness. Ephesians 2 says that, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So your kids, your grandkids, you are born dead. <laughs> Seems kind of a, a, a paradox, doesn't it? We are all born dead. We don't just do sin, we are sinners. They don't have spiritual life when they are born. And life is a gift, everybody needs life. It's a deep reality and that's why conversion, coming to Jesus is not about just getting the facts right. It's about the Holy Spirit coming in and giving us life which is why we need to be praying. Because we don't change one another, we don't become different just by a few different information pieces. And then fourth, sin, this lostness is the spiritual inability. First Corinthians says the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Which means is as Christians, we should not be treating anybody like, how come they don't get it? What's wrong with them? Somehow we're smarter? No. Sin is, makes us so we can't understand these things. It seems foolish. And if you're listening in today and some of this seems foolish, part of it is because it is spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit has to work in us. So notice that they're actually not able to understand. In fact, they're hostile to God's ways, which is why in many places in the world, Christians are killed. They don't understand why these people do Christianity, and so they want to kill them. They're hostile to it. Sin is a spiritual problem. Romans 8 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. Which is why we need to pray more than convince people logically, although there is a place for reason. And then sin is being under, lostness is being under the wrath of God. Notice how Jesus words it. He says in John 3, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe, does not obey the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Notice it doesn't say the wrath of God will come on him. It says it remains on him. In other words, it was already there. So the wrath of God is resting on all of us dead, fallen, rebellious, hostile people. And the wrath of God, though, through Christ, will be taken away. Lostness is the remaining of wrath on us. And where our deception creeps in is when we look at the good people around us and we think, good grief. God isn't a God of wrath. He's a God of love. So surely he wouldn't condemn people, would he? Well, let's look at some key scriptures to help remove some of our doubts. Romans chapter one. 
Verse 18 says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Invert down to verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor give thanks to him. Now these verses are in the context without Christ even around yet. What, what Paul is saying in Romans is, is nobody has an excuse. We are all suppressing truth. We, are all, we all know God, but we choose not to be thankful to him. The problem is God's revelation in nature is not sufficient to save us. It's just enough to condemn us and show us that we can't make it. And the isolated person who has never heard of Jesus still knows God, but suppresses truth. And so Paul says, therefore, they are all without excuse, or they're guilty. They're not guilty because they haven't heard the gospel. They're guilty because they haven't honored their creator. In other words, it's not the absence of something, namely faith, but the presence of something, namely rebellion. Secondly, in Romans chapter 10, Paul gives us this logical procession. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he goes on and says, how then will they call on him and who they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so the logic that Paul puts out is the only way to be saved is through Christ. The only way to call on his name is to believe the gospel. The only way to believe the gospel is to hear it. And the only way to hear it is that somebody shares it with them. And so the reality is that salvation or being saved only comes through the word of Christ. John 14 Jesus said, and this is a very exclusive statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And immediately some people think, okay, you're one way to God. But then he goes on, he says, but no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's where we part ways with a lot of religions. See, Hindus can believe that Jesus is a way to God, but the only way? I don't think so. It sounds narrow. And yet we all know that there are truths that are only true one way. Two plus two is always four. If you're going to cross the Grand Canyon, you can say all you want. You know, you can hop across there if you like. It's fine. No. I want to go on the bridge. Because otherwise I'm probably going to fall down and die. Right? So there are some truths that are very exclusive. And Jesus says, you got to come by the truthful way. you got to come through me. Acts chapter 4. Peter says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And it seems as though knowing this Savior's name, his precise identity, is important. One last passage. And we don't have time to read it all, but let me just tell you the story. Cornelius, a devout Gentile, a good person, he is instructed by God in a dream to go and get, find this man called Peter. And after Peter has a vision and uh, learns a little bit himself about the fact that God wants everybody to be saved, he goes to Cornelius' man. And the Bible tells us he was an upright, God-fearing centurion who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. He's a good guy. And he's directed by his angel to send for Peter to come to his house to hear what he has to say. And so Peter comes. In verse 33 of chapter 10 says, Now we are all here in the presence of God to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. What's interesting is, is that Cornelius wasn't expecting any random message, but specifically how he could be saved. And so, Paul, so Peter tells him that it is through Jesus and he is saved. 
Now that's a little bit about the fact that people are lost. Here's some of the good news. Over 2,000 Christmases ago, God sends a Savior. What many people can't grasp is that God is both wrathful and loving. A God who not only threatens with wrath, but also bears up under that wrath and takes it on himself. That's part of the mystery of God. And as any good parent knows, that real love always comes with some discipline as well. There are always consequences if you really love your kids. First Timothy says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Yes, we're all lost. And we deserve eternal separation from God. And, and nobody has to go there because there's a Savior. Amen? The other good news about Christmas, about Christ, is that there's this gift for us of righteousness. None of us does it perfectly. Jesus said, be perfect as that I am perfect. And in the same breath knew that we couldn't do it. But what he was trying to say is take on my righteousness. It's a gift for you if you'll take it. Romans says, as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. In other words, through Adam and all those ancestors. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Sometimes I think we're trying so hard to do what's right as Christians, we forget that it's Jesus' righteousness that saves us. We choose to do good because we want to follow him, but that's not, our goodness does not save us. It's the goodness of Jesus that saves us. See, I have the Savior's obedience, his righteousness that gives me freedom and salvation. Amen? And there's no condemnation. Romans 8 verse 3 says, God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son into the in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned it. So in your toughest moments, when you are feeling discouraged, when you are facing death or an uncertain future, and you have to face God. One of our biggest fears, one of our questions, will I face condemnation? And what we need to preach to ourselves at that moment is that if I stand in Christ, there is no condemnation. See, that already happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. God put our condemnation on him. And if all of your friends and relatives would believe, it would be the same for them. He bore our curse as well. Galatians 3.16, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. See, Christ took away the damning power of Satan. Like one preacher once said, he's defanged him. Satan's still around. But he doesn't have the power. Colossians 2 says, The record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he canceled it. This he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. And then listen carefully. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. So Satan is still around, but he's got no power over us. He wants to bring this long list of accusations accusations to the courtroom and God says sorry it's already covered you got no case forget it run away it's been defeated and then we have peace he secured our peace and Galatians 4 says when the fullness of time had come God sent forth his, forth his son born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons 
See, there's peace with us and God now that we actually become part of his family, that we can cry out, Abba, Father, an endearing term that you only talk about about your daddy. Yes, he's our king and we need to honor him and respect him, but he's also our daddy that we can sit on his lap and feel the bond, the peace of family. And then we've got eternal life. 1 John 5, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. God brings us into the presence of God forever. And Jesus was very clear that eternal life is not this distant thing that happens when we die. You can have life right now. You can begin that taste of the kingdom of God and of eternal life right now if you come to Jesus. And when we get to heaven, it's going to be amazing. Psalm says, in your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. But it's by faith. So Acts tells us, whoever believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is what we want for those we know around us. We want them to come to faith, to trust in Jesus, to believe in his name. And faith is simply embracing Jesus for the satisfaction of your souls. And Jesus said to the people, he says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I think every one of us room, in this room, we thirst for stuff. We watch shows on TV because we want something to give us some joy, distraction, when we really need to come to Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, that thirst, that ache inside is quenched. No one is beyond God's power of, to save. You know, we all know people that have been away from God for many years. But they're not beyond God's power to save. Remember the disciples who came to him? And Jesus said, you know, a camel can't get through an eye of an eel. He was talking about salvation, how hard it is for rich to get to heaven. And the disciples said, well, well, then who can possibly be saved? And Jesus said, with man it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Your kids are savable. <laughs> your relatives, your coworkers, whatever the worst person you can think of in the world, they're savable because nothing is impossible with God. So I think one of the things we need to be doing as parents, as kids, as grandparents, is praying like crazy. Keep God central in your life. Take sin and eternal lostness seriously. Remember that lost people are spiritually dead. They can't understand. Realize we don't have the power to save, but God does. Jesus does. Never forget that God is just, and he's also merciful. And above all, keep the cross in view. And remember that Jesus accomplished everything necessary to save his people. No one is too hard for God to save. Pray earnestly, regularly for the lost ones you love. And in your emails, in your cards, in your letters, in your conversations at work, Share what you're seeing and enjoying about Jesus. That's what it means to be a witness. Just share and explain what you're seeing. What's God doing in your life? And if you're not seeing anything, you need to look a little harder. You need to ask God, give me a thankful heart. Bring back the thankfulness that was there when I first met you so that I can share the joy with other people. Trust in God's love and his timing. Amen. Let's pray as we come to the communion table this morning. Lord, forgive us for the many times we have forgotten about how good you are. And I pray for anybody listening today that if they're not sure 
about their eternal destiny, if they don't know you, that you would draw them to yourself, to have the courage to say, Jesus, I am so tired of trying, running in different directions, trying to find joy and happiness on a screen and in my escapes, my addictions. I want to come to you. Jesus, fill our hearts today with your joy, your salvation, through your Holy Spirit, which you promised to us. Fill us with your spirit today as we share your table. In Jesus' name, amen. You should have one of these cups. If you don't, just wave madly and somebody might get you one. Um, There's a couple here that need some. Just keep your hand up so we can see you. If you're at home, you may want to run to the fridge and get some juice or something to eat with it. And so that we can share the table together. And just remember, it's not about what we eat and drink. It's about what it represents. I'm sure some of you are thinking this is kind of hopeless, right? <laughs> it's not like the old bread and stuff, right? But uh, this is what we do in COVID. And it's okay because it's what it represents. It's the blood and body of Christ. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus actually earnestly, eagerly wanted to celebrate this meal with his disciples because he loved them and he longed for them to experience the fullness of that covenant that he was making on the cross. And he wanted to focus their attention on the cross because we so desperately need what Jesus did on the cross to find our way in a dark world. And so Jesus, when he sat with his disciples, he took the bread and he says, this is my body broken for you. Let's pray and thank God for what he has done in this gift of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you so much that in an age full of narcissism and people that are just looking out for themselves, that you came to give everything you had for us. You said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve others. I didn't come for myself. I came to save people that are lost. And you looked around that room in the upper room with love at Judas, at Peter, at Matthew, at the brothers fighting with each other. And you loved them and you washed their feet. And you said, I'm making a covenant with you regardless of your response. While you're still sinning, I will die for you. Lord, thank you for your broken body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat this in remembrance of Jesus. And after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood shed for you in an eternal covenant and a covenant that God cannot break, will never break. There's something mysterious about the way God has orchestrated through history to make blood something that must be spilt to pay for sin. Many places in the world will spill blood for serious crimes. Jesus spilt his blood freely for all of us. I find it interesting that Jesus did not just get a you know, pinprick so a little drop of blood came out. No. He was subject to the worst form of beatings possible 39 lashes, these hooks that ripped into his skin. He was flowing with blood. This crown of thorns with huge thorns that stuck into his head. Blood spilt everywhere. The sword in his side. 
there was any blood left, it came out in his hands, in his feet, in his side. And Jesus spilt his blood so that it would be clearly seen that his blood was shed to play, pay for our sins. Let's thank God for Christ's shed blood that completely covers our sin. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you didn't just come to this earth to be born in a pretty manger scene. You came with the express purpose to suffer and die for us, to shed your blood freely for us in all the agony you put up with it because you knew it was the requirement for our sin, that our sins had to be paid for. There was a penalty for the sin. God, thank you for completely and overwhelmingly covering my sin in Jesus. Give me the courage to live under the promise of that shed blood that saves us forever, that completely gives us righteousness forever, that makes us your brothers, that makes us part of your family, saints. God, we have so much in you because of your shed blood. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. And after the meal, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Let's drink it together. We have a great God, don't we? Our worship team's gonna come and sing one Last song before we close, go tell it on the mountain. You don't have to go up to the mountain to tell it either. You can tell it this morning. You can tell it when you leave here. We got to tell the message more. Let's stand together as we sing. the reading earlier of this week being the, the week focusing on peace. So as we go now, be people of peace. Let peace live in your heart and share the peace of Christ with all you meet. Share peace by acting out of compassion and not fear. Share peace by listening to all sides of the story. Share peace by praying for our world. And in this Advent season, we need to see and feel and share peace. 
And as you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share the peace and hope that is only found in Jesus with those you meet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.